Welcome back to Investigate Joe Rogan, the podcast where I investigate things that have been said on the Joe Rogan experience. This will probably be kind of a short episode. There's not too much to discuss here. Many of you probably don't even remember this episode. It was so long ago now. It's the one with Bill Maher. Um, he is the George Bush guy. If you, if you need to think back a little bit to remember this, that was kind of his thing. This was an episode where COVID was discussed a lot. I feel like there was a long COVID break with little to no COVID discussion. And now it's kind of back, now that the, the heat has died down a little bit. Rogan says that quarterback Aaron Rodgers is allergic to something that is in the vaccine. And that is the real reason he couldn't take it. We're going back to Aaron Rodgers now. That was in the news. So Rogers said in an interview that he has, quote, an allergy to an ingredient that's in the mRNA vaccines. Now, technically, it is possible to be allergic to the vaccine. How Aaron Rodgers would know he was allergic, I have no idea. But you can be allergic. However, it is exceedingly rare. According to the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, quote, reactions to vaccines in general are rare with the occurrence of anaphylaxis estimated at 1.31 in 1 million doses given. Subsequent to the FDA emergency use authorization of the mRNA-based Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine on December 11, 2020, and the Moderna vaccine on December 18, 2020, Anaphylaxis rates as of January 29, 2021, are reported by the CDC to be 5 per million with Pfizer BioNTech and 2.5 per million with Moderna. The anaphylaxis rate for the Johnson Johnson COVID 19 vaccine has now been reported. So let's put this into perspective. I'll use the worst one as an example to be charitable to Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> For the Pfizer vaccine, there were five cases per million of anaphylaxis, which is a severe allergic reaction, if you don't know. That would mean your chance of having an allergic reaction would be 0.0005%. This is comparable to something like being struck by lightning, which is like the proverbial improbable thing that never happens. So I'm not saying that he's definitely lying, but I would say that there's a 99.9995% chance that he's lying. So I'll leave that one for you to decide. You can do the odds on that one. You can't always trust these football players is the thing. I mean, think about OJ. It was really the lying that was the worst part, in my opinion. At one point, Jamie says that there's no way of knowing what's in the vaccine, which is not true. You can look up a list of ingredients in like two seconds. In fact, it's so easy to find that I suspect he himself looked it up, found it, but then didn't want to chime back in and correct his own mistake. Because it would be kind of embarrassing if he said one thing all episode, and then the second thing he said was, oh yeah, that first thing I said wasn't correct. He, he gets like one line a week. Obviously, that, that's not what you want. This raises the important question, though, of who can police Jamie. Jamie is essentially above the law, and in the rare instances where he is the source <laughs> of wrong statements, there's nothing anybody can do. The implications of this are very dark and serious. This is the premise of Watchmen. In other COVID news, Rogan says that a heavy dose of antibiotics is a good way of combating coronavirus, which is also not true. This is because it is not a bacteria, it is a virus. There's nothing else to that question other than that simple fact, which again could have been looked up in two seconds. We get a lot of Bill Maher's opinions on medicine in this episode. He is clearly very skeptical of so-called Western medicine, which is not something I was aware of. I have a sort of only a basic level understanding of Bill Maher, but when you think of him, I, I did not know that this was going to be his deal. In particular, he is very skeptical of x-rays. This is something that he brings up multiple times throughout the episode. X-rays are radiation, but they really aren't that bad. 
A typical chest x-ray is comparable to 10 days of natural background radiation. So basically like going outside for 10 days. Other types of x-rays have more, um, but such small doses of radiation really aren't that bad. You shouldn't get an x-ray or a CT scan if you don't really need one. That is true. But the thing is, eventually you will need one. And there is no alternative. So it's kind of worth the risk. I highly doubt Bill Maher would go to the doctor and turn down an x-ray if they said he legitimately needed it. Like, imagine a doctor telling Bill Maher, listen, you have a mysterious thing in your kidney, and you need an x-ray. We need to find out what it is. Do you really think he's going to say, mm, no, I'm good. I don't want to know what it is because I'm too paranoid about x-rays and just walk out of the hospital? No way. I, I, I seriously doubt he has that level of commitment. I was not thrilled to read, however, um, that it's, it's like never advisable to get a CT scan that you don't need because uh, I had to get a CT scan. Uh, I did need it, though, because I have tons of kidney stones. That was a big part of why this episode was delayed, because I was in uh, extreme pain. Mar is also quite skeptical about tattoos, something which Rogan obviously pushed back against, because he's tatted up. And I think Rogan is right on this one. I could not find any confirmed long-term negative health effects of tattoos. Yes, it is, it is possible to get an infection or whatever, and there's random rare cases people have had where they had a problem. And if you get like a sketchy one in the back of an alley or in a prison cell, it's probably going to get infected and cause you problems. But there's nothing out there that says tattoos are bad for you somehow in the long term. This is just a podcast, obviously, so you can't see my face. But I was, I was glad to hear this, because I have a tattoo of Bart Simpson on my neck uh, in military fatigues with a speech bubble that says desert storm was hell. <laughs> Maher also suggests that the quote normal human lifespan is 100 years and that in the blue zones people frequently live to be 100. I've talked about the blue zones uh, before. If you know anyone in real life who's like a hypochondriac who's real paranoid about their lifespan they all know about the blue zones. <laughs> they're all, they're all like constantly looking up the blue zones and like blue zone data. It's it's there. It's a big thing for these people. Um, but Mar is wrong. People in the blue zones do not frequently live to be a hundred. They do frequently live to be older than average. That's why they are the blue zones. People in them live longer than the average population around them. As, as for the idea that 100 is the normal human lifespan, I'm really not even sure what this means. Does he think that people used to usually live to be 100 before Western medicine took over? Because I assure you that that was not the case. Or does he think that humans have like the potential to live to be 100 regularly if they avoid x-rays and getting tattoos? I really don't know, but I, I don't think there's any way to interpret this where it is correct somehow. I suspect that Mar is one of these elites who thinks that he's going to live forever thanks to the magical powers of technology. He says that Ray Kurzweil wrote that the singularity will occur in just six years in 2028. Actually, Kurzweil realized that this wasn't going to happen, so he changed his prediction to 2045. He will most likely, well, he'll hopefully be dead by 2045. So this means he won't be alive for people to point out that he was wrong yet again. This is kind of just what people do with the singularity and superintelligence and so on. It's always happening, you know, just in the future. You just have to wait, you know, two more weeks, and it's really going to happen this time. And I think all of Mars' weird health opinions combined with the fact that he's even aware of who Kurzweil is, probably means that he is obsessed with immortality and uh, he wants to live forever. You know, the, like the Alex Jones rant where he's talking about like the big enchilada 
and he says, like, the elites want to know all this stuff and they want to live forever. That's, like, basically true, I think. I do not, not most of what he said, but I do think it's true that the prevailing sort of uh, hobby of the elites is immortality and, uh, like, longevity. It's definitely a thing, especially in L.A. Um, there seems to be a weird sort of thing where people in L.A. who are really rich, you know, think that, like, amethyst shavings will help them live forever. It's really a throwback. This is not a new thing. You know, ye olden emperors and kings used to drink mercury and consult uh, magicians and things to try and live for as long as possible. And I think this is just sort of continuing that tradition, really. Mar Mars' general argument against medical science, and that's, see, <laughs> that sounds severe, but that's really what it is. He has this, a sort of general criticism of medical science, which is that he says we're still at the infancy of understanding how the human body works. And this sort of fuels all of his skepticism. He says, well, they don't even know how the brain works. They don't even know it gives you cancer. So how can they tell me what this vaccine does or what an x-ray does? But this argument is really not a good one because we will never reach a point where like medical technology has been perfected. Unless you're like a Ray Kurzweil type and you think that we're headed for like a magical, you know, luxury techno utopia where the elites just like hand everyone like free stuff and you get to live in a computer or whatever. We're never going to have a point where everybody knows everything about the human body. And we're always going to be at the infancy if the future continues on forever. So you can always say, well, we don't know everything. But this applies to more things than medicine, which is why I don't think he really grasps here. Like you could say this about physics. You could say, well, we don't know everything about physics. We haven't like uncovered every mystery of the universe. So how can you really say that the earth is round? Or how can you really say what's going on with gravity? Well, you just sort of have to go with what the best information is. You can't just kick the ball down the road and say, yeah, but in the future, people could change their minds. You kind of just have to go with what we have, even if there might be a paradigm shift in the future. Towards the end, they discuss the potential dangers of weed. And Rogan says that weed smoke isn't as bad for you as tobacco smoke is. This is probably true. However, as a member of the anti-fun police, I am obligated to point out that cannabis smoke contains ammonia, hydrogen cyanide, and carcinogens. It also provably increases your risk of bronchitis and lung infections. I don't really bring this up to say that like weed is bad or whatever. I really just want to point out that these supposed health freaks are ultimately very selective with what they apply their skepticism to. Can you imagine how they would react, for instance, if somebody told them that Big Macs contained hydrogen cyanide? This would probably prompt a 10-minute monologue about how fat everyone is, how Americans are, you know, fat, fat piggies, <laughs> and yet they are apparently fine with this when it comes to weed. They are willing to just sort of tank that. Anyway, that is all I have for this episode. I guess it'll be a short episode here. In my mind, I usually get this guy mixed up with Jon Stewart. Thank you for listening. Um, there is a Patreon if you'd like to listen to bonus episodes for $2. And I will see you next episode.